cool. We'll get started a couple minutes early. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, my name is Jonathan Gray. Today, I'm here to talk about real-time big data uh, at Facebook with Hadoop and HBase. Real-time for some definition of real-time. Clearly, I don't mean hard real-time or the traditional kind of real-time. Basically, what I'm talking about here is online, low-latency applications that we're building uh, at Facebook with Hadoop and HBase. So here's the rundown of what we're going to talk about. I'm going to open up with a little bit of history, what data at Facebook looks like, and why we're, we're making a big uh, investment in Hadoop and HBase. Then I'm going to talk specifically about a few use cases of stuff that uh, is actually in production right now on top of, H on top of HBase. And right at the end, I'm going to do a quick thing about the future of HBase at Facebook. So about me. My previous life, I was a co-founder of Streamy.com. It was a real-time social news aggregator. We had a lot of big data problems, and that's what led me originally into the Hadoop and HBase space in about 2008. Uh, back there, I became an HBase committer, and I was a pretty big user of Hadoop, Lucene, Solar, Kata, a whole bunch of that stuff. But today, my life is as a software engineer at Facebook, uh, based in Palo Alto. There I work in data infrastructure, um, but I actually am part of the open source team. Uh, we have a small team, about four people, and each person in my team is responsible for a different kind of area of the company. Uh, for example, someone works a lot with PHP. I work a lot on the data infrastructure side, specifically Hadoop and HBase. Someone else works a lot on Hive, and then we do a lot of stuff around standards, uh, open graph, things like that. And so I develop, deploy, and support HBase as well as other technologies like Hadoop, Hive, Thrift, Scribe, things like that. So why Hadoop and HBase? And specifically, why Hadoop and HBase for real-time data? You know, I think the case has been made for big data, for offline analytics, for data warehousing. Uh, but why do we want to look at these technologies for real-time? What you see here is what Facebook is, was, and will be for a long time. It's the LAMP stack, Linux, Apache, MySQL, PHP. There are some changes here. First, we added memcache, just an in-memory key value thing that we can do a lot of throughput. And also Hadoop for offline data analysis. There are a couple other changes here that I'm not going to show, but uh, if you guys are interested, PHP and Apache now has actually been replaced by something called HipHop, which is a PHP to C++ compiler. And we actually deploy these binaries uh, across our web tier now. If you guys are interested in that, it's a, an open source project. And I can talk more about that offline. So what's wrong with this stack? It's the LAMP stack. Everyone scales it. It's working for us right now at Facebook. So why do we need to change anything? Well, MySQL gives you a lot limited throughput, especially when you're talking about writes. It's not inherently distributed. We've built a big distribution layer on top of it, obviously. But inherently, MySQL is a single node piece of software. MySQL also suffers from table size limits. So the bigger and bigger your table gets, the slower your writes are and the slower your reads are. And MySQL also has a very inflexible schema. There's been a lot of improvements made here where we can change schemas online. But in general, it's a very fixed row-oriented schema. Memcache, on the other hand, very, very fast, very high throughput. But it's only key value. So all the data inside of the values is completely opaque, meaning there's no write through. If I have 100 megabytes as a value and I want to change one byte of it, I have to evict the entire 100 megabytes and then fill it up again. Now Hadoop is very scalable, but MapReduce is slow. So it's not suited for online, real-time stuff. Writing MapReduce is also inherently a very difficult thing. And there's no support for random writes. And there's poor support for random reads. So these are not new things. This didn't just happen. But in the past couple of years, what this has led to is lots of specialized solutions. There's a very strong engineering culture at Facebook. And a lot of teams are real smart and just build their own solutions to their own problems. So we've ended up with a lot of different systems. For example, inbox search. This is not the new messaging, but the old messaging was based on Cassandra. 
Cassandra was actually built at Facebook for inbox search, basically because MySQL and our existing systems were not well suited for it. Also, high throughput but persistent key value. Memcache is very high throughput key value, but it doesn't persist. Some applications you want the persistence, and the throughput is so high, you can't use MySQL. So a lot of teams are using Tokyo Cabinet. Sometimes people are using Tokyo Cabinet on Flash, sometimes just on spinning disks. And then for our large scale data warehousing, uh, Facebook implemented Hive, which is now an open source Apache project, uh, which adds a SQL-like layer on top of MapReduce. And then we have lots and lots of these custom C++ servers for other stuff. Anything that you need to do high throughput, in memory, persistent, whatever, mostly in memory stuff, um, but I need to do unique user calculations or I need to do a lot of counting. A lot of teams just end up building their own C++, uh, C++ server stuff. But there's a lot of problems with all these specialized solutions. There's no central maintenance. There's no central administration. If the person who built it on a team leaves to another team or to another company, everyone's kind of shit out of luck. So this is not really a sustainable, uh, scalable way to go about scaling our data. So Facebook went to find a new online data storage system. And when we started looking at everything that we were doing, some consistent patterns were emerging. Massive data sets, but m often lots and lots of the data, a vast majority of that data is inactive. It has to be available for reads, but it's not frequently read. It's, it's a temporal, recent set of data that gets read, and all the other data is just there and very infrequently read. And that's a bad match for MySQL. Lots and lots of writes, very, very write-heavy systems. Some reads, fewer reads than writes. Also, dictionaries and lists. Dictionaries and lists basically is 95% of all the data, right? You have entities like a user or a group or a profile or a page or an application, and they have a bunch of dimensions like here's the name and here's the email address and here's the ID. And lists are kind of like associations. Like here's the different posts in my feed, here's my friend list, uh, all that kind of stuff. So a vast majority of data fits into a very simple type of schema that you don't really need a full row-oriented RDBMS. And also entity-centric schemas. So this is kind of why Cassandra was built in the first place, is that you want to do a lot of things at the per user or per domain or per application level. So the inbox search, for example, I only need a search index of my inbox, right? I don't need a global index across all search, uh, all users. And it's difficult to do that kind of thing with most search systems. So then we laid out some of the other higher level requirements. We really wanted something that was elastic, something that we didn't have to worry about the distribution. We could grow it and shrink it automatically. We really wanted high availability. We didn't want to have to worry about nodes going down. We didn't want to have to worry about whatever. We also wanted strong consistency within a data center. Primary reason for this is caching. Facebook caches a lot. We have tons and tons of memory, and that's how the site is is fast, um, and having eventual consistency with a cache on top of it can be a very difficult thing to reconcile. Um, we also really wanted fault isolation. What we found in MySQL tier and all these other things is that disks die constantly. Every day, many, many disks are dying. And so we wanted to make sure that if one disk dies on one node, it doesn't bring down the cluster, it doesn't even bring down that node. So individual faults don't necessarily have a big impact. We also had some non-requirements. Network partitions within a single data center. The reason this was a non-requirement is basically because of how our existing systems work. If we had a network partition inside of a data center, we were already screwed. <laughs> so second non-requirement, active-active serving for multiple data centers. This is a very similar reason that because of our existing architectures, we, uh, any given user was always being pinned to a single data center, so it's certain, uh, independent user didn't have to actually read from two data centers at once. So, early 2010, around the time I joined Facebook, uh, engineers at Facebook were comparing databases or data stores. The three leading candidates, Apache Cassandra, 
Apache HBase and our existing sharded MySQL system. We compared it on dimensions of performance, scalability, and the features that it came with. And what we found was HBase gave us excellent write performance. It gave us good enough read performance. And HBase already included a bunch of nice to have features that we wanted. Atomic read, modify, write operations, kind of compare and swaps. Multiple shards per server, which really made recovery and a lot of other things more optimal. Also bulk importing facilities. Because of the tight integration with HDFS, HBase supports writing directly into HDFS and then importing into HBase uh, instantly, basically. And that means you can write a lot of data into HBase uh, at the speed that you can write to your disks. And when you have to migrate existing data from other systems, that turns out to be a really big deal. Also range scans. But the biggest reason that we use HBase is that it uses HDFS. And we get the benefits of HDFS for free. The fault tolerance of HDFS, the scalability of HDFS, the fact that HDFS does automatic checksumming and automatically will fix corruptions without you having to worry about it. Very, very tight MapReduce integration, which we use heavily. Fault isolation of disks on some versions of HDFS. And also, HDFS is battle tested at petabyte scale at Facebook. We have a 36 petabyte, 3,000 node cluster that we run 24 7. And so we have lots and lots of existing operational experience and a lot of just general trust and faith in HDFS. So the fact that HBase is built on HDFS is a big part of the reason we're using it. So what is Apache HBase? Originally, it was part of the Hadoop project with the aim of adding random read and write access on top of HDFS. At Facebook, it did require some changes. Uh, some of this stuff was built at Facebook, some of it outside, um, and some of it is not yet in an Apache branch. But file appends, which is an Apache, um, this gives you uh, data durability. Also, the HA name node, uh, a very contentious kind of issue, but Facebook has a something called avatar node, which we use, um, and that's basically an HA name node, though in practice, it's not a really big issue for us. We've done a lot of read optimizations in HDFS. Um, there's a local shortcut reader, uh, all different kinds of things like that. And in addition to all this stuff, HBase also uses Zookeeper. Zookeeper is a system that we're using more and more at Facebook, and this is just another one of the systems that are, that are using it. So really quick, this is what HBase looks like. Up at the top, you have HBase itself. You have a master, and you have as many backup masters as you want. And then the region servers are the slave servers that actually host the shards. For storage, it uses HDFS. You have your name node, secondary name node, and data nodes. And then for coordination, you have Zookeeper. In general, at Facebook, we're building 100 node HBase clusters. And we're using the top of rack machines as the kind of master nodes. So the name node, secondary name node, uh, HBase master, backup master, and then all five of them will be the Zookeeper quorum. The reason we build in 100 node pods, we call them, is basically um, kind of fault isolation. So if I need 1,000 nodes for my user base, if I build one 1,000 node cluster and something happens, every user is impacted. But if I build 10 100 node clusters, if something happens to one cluster, only 10% of the user base is going to be impacted. So. HBase in a nutshell, it's sorted, column oriented, high write throughput, horizontal scalability, automatic failover, and the regions are sharded dynamically. I'm going to talk more about these in the context of uh, the use cases. And that's where I am now. So applications of HBase. The first one is the most publicized one. Um, you guys may have heard about it. Titan was the code name for the new version of Facebook Messages which almost all of you probably have now, hopefully. What is Facebook Messages? It's a new version which combines uh, existing messaging with IMs, with email, and with SMS. This was the largest engineering effort in the history of Facebook. Facebook traditionally has very small teams. 15 engineers over more than a year. 
and they incorporated 20, more than 20 infrastructure technologies, Hadoop and HBase, as well as Haystack, which is our photo storage, uh, Zookeeper, and a whole bunch of other stuff. One of the big challenges here is this is a product at massive scale on day one, right when you launch. This wasn't a new product. We were actually migrating an existing product. This meant hundreds of millions of active users right away. The existing load on messages before email and all this other stuff, 15 billion messages a month, 50,000 instant messages a second. So lots and lots and lots of writes. So like I said, high write throughput. Every message, every instant message, every SMS, and every email needs to be persisted. We need to build search indexes per user on all of that. And the other thing was, one of the requirements for the product team was they wanted a denormalized schema, which meant if I'm in a conversation with five people and I send a message, there's five copies of that being stored in each person's inbox. Lots of writes. Also really big clusters because of all these writes. There's so much data, there's so much usage, there's also lots of reads that the server footprint is just going to be massive. And we don't want outages to impact the availability of it. And we need to be able to easily scale out. So this is a lot of the reason why we went with HBase for this application. So a quick diagram to kind of describe why HBase has high write throughput. On the left here, you see the commit log. The commit log is uh, kind of like a write ahead log and it is a write ahead log. And this is how HBase gets durability. Every single write, oh god, there it is. Every single write comes in, call it a key value. The first thing it does is you do a sequential write onto the end of the H log. The H log is in HDFS, and we use HDFS's appends so that we can write it, and then we can issue a sync, and that will guarantee us that it's on three nodes. So from there on, we've guaranteed durability for that edit. Then it gets put into memory, into a sorted structure in memory, because HBase is sorted. And so there's only been one sequential write onto disk for the commit log, and then we write into the mem store. Over time, the mem store is going to fill up. And when it crosses a certain threshold, the entire thing is going to be flushed out as one file into HDFS in one big sequential write. So the reason for the high write throughput is that both of our writes to disk are just long sequential writes, and there's no random I.O. involved. The other thing is the horizontal scalability. These blue things down here are shards, and that's also what's represented up on this line. So this line up top is the key space, and each of that is a region or a shard. And so right now, these two servers are each holding four shards. If I add a third server, HBase automatically takes care of rebalancing some of that load, putting it on the other server. The other thing is automatic failover. So here's your nodes again. Here's your regions. HBase client talking to this, this region over here. That server crashes. HBase automatically takes care of rebalancing all those shards onto other servers. HBase client finds the new location and talks to that shard again. So all this stuff just happens automatically. And at the scale that we're talking about, this was a really big deal. Use case two, Puma. So a little bit of history. Puma is a system that was replacing an existing system. It's basically an ETL system. So this is what it used to look like. At the front, as always, you have the web tier. The web tier is going to emit a ton of logs, all different kinds of impression information, tracking information, everything you can possibly imagine, we're logging. And we're using Scribe to write all that into HDFS. Then via MapReduce, we're basically creating Hive tables. We're running a bunch of analytics on top of that. And then we're using SQL from the Hive output to actually store rollups and things like that. Very typical kind of ETL pipeline. And then the web tier is going to read that data if it needs to using SQL. The issue with this, this is about an 8 to 24 hour pipeline. So if I write something on the web tier and I want to be able to read the, the transformations and rollups off of that data, it's going to be about 8 to 24 hours. So Puma is what I call real-time ETL. 
We still have the web tier, we still have Scribe, and we're still writing into HDFS. But now what we're doing is we're utilizing the sync append that I talked about earlier so that we can actually write to a file and then people can read from it at the same time through something we have called ptail. Ptail is basically a tail for HDFS to files that are being written to. And it deals with a lot of sharding and things like that. I'll talk a little more about it. So Puma is what uses ptail. And all Puma does is takes a log line and does something to it, and then does, and then does uh, HBase operations. HTable is the name of the uh, HBase API. And then that goes into HBase. And then all the uh, front end reads, they just go through our Thrift interface. This pipeline is about 10 to 30 seconds. So obviously massively different. It's a very game changing kind of thing as far as the products that we can build on top of it. Um, and it's very highly reliable. Each step in the chain is uh, basically fault tolerant, highly available. So I'm going to talk more about Puma. It's the real-time data pipeline. We're utilizing all the existing log aggregation stuff, so there's no changes on the front end. We're extending the low latency capabilities of HDFS with the sync and ptail. And then we're utilizing HBase for its high throughput random reads and writes. This basically gives us support for real-time aggregations. We're heavily utilizing HBase atomic increment operations to basically maintain rollups in real time. And we also are building some kind of complex HBase schemas to do things like unique users. And then we're storing all of our checkpoint information back into HBase. So HBase is the only persistent store. HDFS too. One way I like to think about Puma is as real-time MapReduce. The map phase is ptail. So all these different web clients are using Scribe, which is basically an aggregator, to write into a single file or set of files in HDFS. Ptail will take that log stream, which is just going to be one stream, and then you divide it automatically into n shards. So I can say I want 10 clients or I want 50 clients, and that's basically your map split. The first version was only random bucketing, so it would just hash something randomly and throw it into a random bucket. But new, the new version supports application level bucketing. So you can actually say, every single thing for this user is always going to go to this shard, things like that. And then the reduce happens inside of HBase. Every row and column in HBase becomes an output key. And then we aggregate key counts using atomic counters. And then we're also doing other things that you can do in a reduce, like if we just want to keep appending a list of stuff, or we want to create some other kind of operation against the data. So the first application for Puma was Facebook Insights for URL and domains. This is basically so that any domain owner from an individual blogger to NewYorkTimes.com or whatever could see deep analytics for their site. All the clicks, shares, impressions, comments, likes, all that stuff graphed over time. And also anonymized, detailed demographic breakdown across all of these different dimensions. And we're also doing top end calculations. So we can say, these are your top 10 URLs today, this week, this month. And we actually can also do global top URLs. This is a really big throughput system because it's measuring every single impression of everything. So if you like something, and then that like shows up in someone's newsfeed, we're measuring that impression, and we're also taking all the demographic data of that impression. There's billions of URLs, and we're doing today over a million counter increments per second. Uh, so HBase has been really, really good for this. Uh, and in the end, the performance of this system is always coming down to, can we fit the working set in memory or not? Today, we actually can't. And so that's our bottleneck is the amount of random reads we have to do. So here's just a little preview of what it looks like. Um, basically, we bucket these counters into hours, and then we can graph them over time. We calculate click-through rates, things like that. And then on any given dimension, you can look at the demographic breakdown. So by age, uh, this is like age crossed with um, sex, or by country, or by language, a whole bunch of different dimensions. So what's the future of Puma? 
Well, Puma is one of the first centrally managed services that is going to be for a bunch of different products. So there's an infrastructure team that's actually managing it versus the product teams themselves building it. We have a bunch of other stuff in development, commerce, tracking, um, ad insights, which is a really big one, and a bunch of other ones. One of the big efforts underway right now is making Puma generic. Right now, the business logic lives inside of Puma written in Java, which makes it a little bit difficult to change. So we're working on a way to dynamically configure it from the front end. So if the front end wants to add a new log stream or they want to change the format, they want to add a new dimension, whatever, they can just do it from the front end. Infrastructure doesn't have to know about it. We're also building a qu custom query language very, very early. Can't say much about it yet because I don't know what it looks like yet. Last use case I'm going to talk about, ODS. It's our internal metrics system. ODS stands for Operational Data Store. We store everything in here. System metrics, CPU, memory, I.O., network, all that stuff. Application metrics from the web, from the DB tier, from our caches, everything you can imagine. And we actually also put Facebook metrics in here. The usage of the site, the revenue, all that stuff. And as a product, the front end allows you to easily graph this data over time. It allows you to make complex transformations on it. It does all different kinds of roll-ups, so you can do some max, min, average, count. Uh, it also does best fit lines and all that kind of stuff. This has been in production for a long time, and it's built on MySQL today. But it's proven really difficult to scale with MySQL. There's millions of unique time series with billions and billions of data points. So it's just a ton of data. But the biggest problem is the irregular data growth patterns. Uh, you might have, basically it's a key entity system, or entity key system. So for this machine name and this metric, here's my number. The problem is maybe I have this one MySQL shard that's serving some product that's been in development for two months, and then the product launches. And all of a sudden, 10,000 metrics an hour is now 10 million metrics an hour. And before you know it, in two days, the MySQL server is bursting at the seams, and you have to reshard that data. In MySQL, resharding that data is physically dividing the data in half and physically moving it to another server. All the while, more data is coming in, and people are still querying it. So the team that ran ODS became less of a product team, more of a MySQL DBA team. So the cool thing about HBase is that it does dynamic sharding of regions. Regions, again, are kind of shards. So here we have this big region that keeps growing. HBase is automatically going to decide, I'm going to split this region in half. Now that server is overloaded because it has four shards. So it'll redistribute that shard to another server. All this stuff happens transparently, so you really don't have to think about how your data is going to grow. Uh, HBase is just going to take care of it, and it's just going to load balance it for you. Real quick. The future of HBase at Facebook. We don't know what it is. Uh, the stuff I just talked about is either in production or pre-production. Um, but what else are we going to do with HBase? We don't know yet. The big thing, though, of course, user and graph data. Is that ever going to make it into HBase? It's a big question right now. And it's something we're spending a lot of effort thinking about. This is the important stuff. So we're looking right now at HBase to augment MySQL, not necessarily replace, but just to augment it in certain places. One thing is that joins and other RDBMS goodies, we're already not using them. We're using MySQL in a very simple way. Any joins are being done already in the application level. We're also building a lot of new abstractions and caches that make things easier. So like I was saying, memcache is very opaque and it's not right through. But we're working on new caches that are more intelligent and understand the data. And like I was saying, most data is either a dictionary or a list. So instead of writing SQL queries, people can use a, an abstraction in the web on the website to basically look at data more as data structures rather than SQL queries. And this kind of data access layer makes it much easier to plug in a different backend uh, instead of something like MySQL. And HBase is really good at dictionaries and lists because it's column oriented. But in the end, this is really a financially motivated decision. Um, MySQL is working for us. 
we're not having many, many issues in this side. But can we save money using HBase? That's the big question. That's what everyone's trying to understand. We have huge database tier, and our data keeps growing, our user base keeps growing, and obviously that's really expensive. So can we use a technology like HBase to save money? And also, are there things that we just couldn't do before? For example, maybe the DB team used to say, well, I want this application, but I need 100,000 writes a second. And they were just like, yeah, 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 we can't do that. So maybe now we can actually do stuff like that. So HBase versus MySQL. At Facebook, MySQL and the size of our database tier, it's completely determined by IOPS, IO operations. Like I said before, MySQL is very heavy on random I.O. for both reads and writes. And today we rely on either fast disks or increasingly flash to basically scale the performance of an individual node. We used to only be able to kind of use 25% of the capacity of a disk because eventually your tables get so slow when they get that big. Now we're augmenting a lot with flash, but this is obviously expensive. HBase has already shown some promise of cost savings here. We've run a lot of kind of A-B tests. We're seeing fewer IOPS on the same workload with HBase. We're able to have much larger tables on denser, cheaper nodes, so we can build lots and lots of disks. We can use two or three terabyte 7200 RPM disks. There's also much simpler operations, and we get replication for free. What I mean by these things, Simpler operations in that if I have a master and a slave, my SQL server and the master goes down, the slave becomes the master, someone has to do something now. Because if the master goes down, we're in trouble. So operationally, it's very intensive. Replication for free, again, master slave. That slave maybe is not serving any traffic or it's read-only traffic, but I have to have two servers that can handle 100% of the load of any given individual server. So I have to buy a lot of resources and overhead just in case something goes down. In HBase, it's using HDFS for replication. And by default, there's going to be three copies of everything. But HDFS stores those, those two other copies at a very, very low cost. They don't take any spindle. They, don't, they take capacity, but they don't take I.O. So the replication is very cheap when compared to the overhead involved with MySQL replication. MySQL is not going anywhere soon at Facebook. Absolutely not. It works. It works well. It's performant. It's rock solid. And we have a dynamite team that works on it. But HBase is a really great addition to the tool belt. There's a whole different set of trade-offs. Your write kind of biased towards write instead of biased towards reads. You get all of the distribution and automatic partitioning, but you don't get any of the relational goodies. Trusting of data that we could replace in a worst case scenario. And like I was saying, there's a potential cost savings here. And that's it. Thank you, everybody, and happy to take questions. Thanks, uh, thanks for the interesting talk. Um, I'm sure there are many questions. Okay, I'll take you first. Since you're yeah, so you had a slide up there that seemed to imply that uh, HBase would scale infinitely horizontally, which I'm sure is not the case. It's also, I don't, I don't think, linearly scalable. So my question is, have you guys like found the, I mean, is, that, is your 100 uh, server pod, is that, does that relate to, a, I don't know, like a point where it tops out for you under your workload? Or? Um, we do find it's linearly scalable. Clearly, it's not infinitely scalable. It I is, think I know what you're talking it about. It is this. linearly scalable, so it if is. you add 10 nodes to a 10-node cluster, you get literally double the capacity? It depends, obviously, on a lot of other factors, but okay. yes, you should, or something close to it. Um, no, the 100 nodes really has to do with five racks, five master nodes. It's kind of a easy to think about failure domain. It's not really a scale limit. Um, we haven't done much testing over maybe one or 200 nodes. But obviously, HDFS, we've run about 3,000-something nodes there, but not with HBase yet. Yeah. Yeah, can you? Hello. Okay. 
Do you still use Cassandra for anything, or is that going away? We are no longer using Cassandra. I just gave a talk about it. <laughs> Hi, John. Two questions, real quick. Um, Ptel, you mentioned having multiple clients, so that's literally the each one of them are getting um, a portion of the total of the tail. They're getting one over n, and you can basically you set n when you start the client. That's nice. Yeah. Um, for your HDFS versus HBase cluster pods, um, you, you mentioned having extremely large HDFS clusters yeah. and these 100, pod, uh, 100 node pods for HBase. Is each 100 node pod of HBase using a 100 node HDFS cluster? Okay, yeah. so, so your other The clusters... HDFS and the HBase match okay. the same region servers, data nodes line up. Is there um, any uh, We're doing some really interesting stuff right now for Puma, actually, and ODS, where these applications, like I was saying, they're basically memory bound, not disk bound. Um, well, they're disk bound if you don't have enough memory, but if you give them enough memory, they're really fast. So one of the things that we're looking at, uh, traditionally we're using machines that are pretty dense, so 12 disks, uh, 48 gigs of RAM, 8 or 12 cores. So you only get 48 gigs of RAM for 12 disks. Some of these applications, we want a lot more memory. So we're actually looking at mixed clusters. So we'll build one cluster that's just memory dense, CPU dense, and then another one that's for storage. So we'll have region servers on one cluster, data nodes on the other. Um, but today, everything that's in production is being built on data node, region server on the same node. Uh, you, you mentioned that uh, you can get write performance of like um, a million increments per second. Um, well, let's actually read modify write. Okay, yeah, which sure. sucks much worse. In increments. <laughs> uh, so, h how many servers do you need for that? Do you need a full hundred? That's a hundred nodes. Okay. Okay, thanks. Uh, I have actually have two questions. First of all, the uh, P-tail in Puma uh, will they be open sourced? Yes. Uh, I'm not sure about Puma's plans. Um, we generally intend to open source data infrastructure stuff. Ptail is part of a scribe, uh, a scribe rewrite that's been done in Java, something called Calligraphus, and that is up for open sourcing very soon. So the scribe side of it and the Ptail side of it definitely is going to be open source soon, and the HDFS stuff obviously is there. Um, Puma itself is actually pretty dumb. I mean, it's a PTL client that takes a log line and does something on HBase. Uh, where the trickiness comes in around that interaction is checkpointing. So PTL will basically tell you what offset in the file you are. So you can kind of say, okay, I've persisted everything in HBase up to this. And then the threading and figuring out how to get a lot of throughput. Um, but yeah, I, one thing about Puma is it's a throughput system, not a latency system. So the reason that we're able to get a million increments a second is we're doing big, big batching when we're writing. So when we write to the wall and things like that, we're batching a lot. So the latency is actually not like one millisecond, but we're able to get really, really big batches. So the throughput's high. Yeah. Second, and the second question I had yeah. is uh, regarding the, uh, shard, uh, the resharding of uh, regions and uh, a failover in case of an, uh, a node failure. How does that impact uh, performance uh, uh, of the HBase? Uh, it does impact performance, and this is one of the really big trade-offs with a Cassandra-type system versus an HBase-type system, is the availability under failure. Um, from Cassandra, you could read from multiple nodes. In HBase, at any given time, you can only read from one node. So if that node dies, there's an availability problem. Uh, the way we deal with it is by constantly making software improvements to make failover really fast. Um, so detection quick, recovery quick, things like that. But what will happen is basically the client is going to either hang or get an exception or a socket timeout or something, and then it's going to look up the new location and go to the new server. So that's a second, or in weird cases, it could be 10 seconds, 20 seconds, up to a minute. It depends. Uh, but this is definitely an essential trade-off of HBase versus Cassandra or something like that. Um, not something we worry about too much because the, the unavailability is short. And uh, we also have a lot of caching. So in Titan, for example, there's a very large caching tier. 
So most stuff is in memory for an active user. Um, for Puma, it's a non-issue. It's one of the really nice things about the Scribe pipeline is if a Puma client dies or HBase goes away, all the data is in HDFS. And you have checkpoints, so you can always go back. There was a question in the front. Oh, okay. Um, any further questions? Cool. Okay, then Thank thanks you. again. <laughs>